Reese quote, know your audience. And it is very good advice because uh, you need to know who's out there when you step on stage. Oh, yeah, you certainly do. Well, I once did a gig for anxiety sufferers right, of Victoria. And so most of the crowd were anxiety, suffered, suffered from social anxiety. So there's like three of us on. And the first guy that gets up does the usual, you know, comic thing where he talks, tries to chat. Where are you from? To the crowd. Hey! So he comes and goes, hey, where are you from? What are you doing for a living? And seriously, at that point, half the audience is hid beyond, underneath their tables. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. It doesn't always go to plan doing the gigs, though, no. Dave. I do a lot of footy clubs. Love it, Trev. You know, I love it. I live for it. I did one at Laylor Football Club, which is a northern suburb of Melbourne. A bit rough. The uh, club room was, there were no windows or anything like that. And, because uh, windows get stolen in Laylor. <laughs> and, and it was 99% men, right? And there was, again, one woman in the corner cooking dim sims in this mini deep fryer. Anyway. Lance Whittle had been in the news. Now, he was a legendary Carlton player. He was a bit tubby. You'd remember him. And yeah, he was. He, he yeah. did carry a little bit of weight. Yes, yes. And he went to a fat farm and he just got back that day. And I got up on stage and I said, gee, I, I didn't know at a fat farm you went to put on fat. And <laughs> that was a much better response than what it got because everyone went really quiet and it went into slow motion and they all turned to look at the woman who dropped her tongs. She had red hair. She was a bit tubby. It was Lance Whittle's mum. <laughs> <laughs> It was his old club. I didn't know. His photo was on the wall behind me. <laughs> <laughs> and it all went downhill from there. It was awful. Yeah, we, we had a, I used to do a lot of um, corporate improv g gigs in New Zealand and we're basically... Uh, corporate sort of improv, improv gigs. So basically theatre sports in a wacky waistcoat. So we would be, um, we'd be hired to go to Christmas functions and stuff and you'd find out a bit of information about the people at the, mm. the gig and then you'd be able to throw in... Because, you know, Phil from Accounts doesn't oh. know where his car is and, you know, <laughs> hilarious! <laughs> that sort of... We were hired for a chicken factory Christmas party and we chicken found factory. out we found out afterwards that we'd actually been hired specifically to block access to the bar <laughs> because the, the fact they didn't want the factory workers to drink too much so they'd put the stage right in front of the bar so we got there at half past four on a Friday afternoon and they were already blind they were completely trashed they were the, the chicken factory workers that plucked all the chickens and stuff like that and their bosses had given them for their Christmas dinner chicken drumsticks <laughs> so they were eating the stuff that they worked with every day so they were angry they were pissed and we were in the way and so we started <laughs> we started doing a wacky improv yeah. set thing and we'd do the you know the game puppets where um, someone moves you or you, you say I'm gonna slap you in the face and then someone moves your hand sure. so you slap them in the face the the Factory workers were so angry by this stage, one of the improvisers goes, oh, I'm going to hit you in the face. And the woman just goes, yeah, hit him, he's a fuckwit. <laughs> <laughs> so it got, started to get really, really ugly. And then they just got tired of us, so they just pelted us with chicken drumsticks oh. until we ran out of the room. It's like trying to catch them in our mouths. It's, weird. <laughs> it's just horrific. Russ, you toured yes. with uh, Russell Crowe's band yes. across America. Yeah, 30 odd foot of grunts and, uh, and sold out all around the country. We did about 14 shows. And but how I sort of uh, came out, I, I was walking around fixing things before the, before I came out like a roadie, and I had me pants this far down, so me bum cracks about this long, and I started turning around at the crowd, fixing things, and then you'd start hearing the, the laughter's sort of going in waves, like they're all starting to notice this bloke with a huge bum crack, and then I look and I, I, I hear a lady going, <laughs> and the other one's going, we shouldn't be laughing. I don't think he's all there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I turn around looking like that. <laughs> it's a common comic scene to go, oh, Jim, mate, you should go to Ballarat. Mate, you would kill up there. I was up there last week. Your material absolutely slays <laughs> <laughs> I've done that at a gig, actually. I did a gig one night where I came on and did my opening line, which you know, you're doing stand-up, you do your best line first, you do your second best line last, and say good night. Yeah. I did my best line first, died, totally died. Did my last line second, it died, knowing that the rest of my act is average in comparison. Yeah. <laughs> and then I just did 15 minute of Bob's act. <laughs> Bob Franklin. <laughs> I had to put him up the next day and say, Bob, you died in your ass last <laughs> My first gig was at the, uh, doing stand-up comedy, was at the George Hotel in Melbourne. There was a strip show. It was called My Bear Lady. I recall that, yeah. A couple of years later, I got approached to work as a DJ downstairs in a place called the Snake Pit. It was a place where if you got out of Pentridge, that's where you went. 
<laughs> That's a fact. So I was working as a DJ, and in those days, you know, you weren't standing up doing grooves or anything. You just had two turntables. You know, he got a bit of a mic. Occasionally he'd say, you know, come on. That was about it. Um, <laughs> so it was a pretty rough joint. There was a bouncer there who came to me and said, look, my girlfriend, this guy, tattoos weren't all that popular back then, and he had a few tats, and he had, one that he had was cut here. Along the neck. Just, just, just along the dotted yeah, line. Dot, 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 dot. <laughs> and he said to me, my girlfriend Betsy works in the saloon bar. He said, she finishes at 10 o'clock. She walks through those saloon doors at 10 past 10. If only you by Ringo Starr is not playing when she walks through those doors, cut here, you are dead meat. Mm. So from about 9.30... <laughs> Only you by Ringo Starr is sitting there ready to go. I'm just working the one. The one here chatting a lot and Backman Turner Overdrive <laughs> coming up and oh, when I was three I fell over. I'm talking <laughs> crap. And sure enough she'd come through. She, she had her hairdo a little bit like uh, Marge Simpson. <laughs> Since I saw Marge, bang, only you. One particular day this didn't actually work. So I thought bugger it and I sang. <laughs> Tonight. It was just desperation, only you. Um, and I swear to God, I got sacked. <laughs> well, I remember um, seeing an English actress on Parkinson. I, I can't recall her name, but uh, she said that she was uh, did a, a, a show on the West End with Spike Milligan, which Spike had written. And basically, uh, she said the set was basically all these doors, like about 100 doors in the set. And for six weeks, she said, he just drilled us, like practising our entrances and exits and when to come on, when to disappear, which door to go through. And she said, the first night we did it, she said, absolutely fantastic. It just went without a hitch. It was great. She said, he never did it the same way again. <laughs> right? So she said, every night after that, he knew where we all were. But we had no idea what he'd do. Like, you know, you'd be standing there with a tray of drinks, like, waiting for your queue, and suddenly the door would open and he'd go, I didn't order those. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> or you'd go, she said, you'd go and uh, uh, try to open the door, and he would have locked it, and he'd say, no, go through that one. And he'd open it up, and there'd be a guy there holding a sheep. Just go. <laughs> I was travelling down the Rialto. Okay. Abseiling. For charity. So we stand on the thing and I'm with three people from the Special Operations Group. They trained you for a whole four hours down at the, where the firemen train on, on four floors and you're zipping down going, how much fun is this? Then you're on top of the Rialto. <laughs> <laughs> Thirteen people in the world have done it. And I'm uh, standing on the side and my feet are over and I'm hanging like this. And then, then, I, then I, I go, I don't want to do this anymore. They said, you can't say no now. They can't pull me back up. I start going down. We go down one floor. We've got a safety harness going to the window. It snaps. <laughs> now, once we get down to 15 floors, we're swinging out 55 feet from the building. <laughs> and, and we're joined to each other. We've got straps and there's bags going around. And then we come back into the window. And there'd be really happy people taking photos. <laughs> I remember once being in a hotel room with um, Judith Lucy and, uh, and Marty Sheargold and we all moved into the same hotel room because we were on a massive bender and we rang down one night, we, we decided we were doing pretentious drinking and drinking French champagne. We rang down and said, we'll have another bottle of French champagne and they went, I'm sorry, we've run out of French champagne, you've drunk it all. We could send up a bottle of Yellow Glen and Judith went, I would sooner drink my own piss than drink Yellow Glen <laughs> and hung up the phone and about five minutes later... She's like, actually, do send up that bottle of yellow. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did a tour, me and Jamone with Glenn Robbins, and, and it was called uh, it was called Standing on the Road. Yes. We used to drive Glenn mad singing a song when we were on tour. Do you remember yes, the name of the yes, song? Yeah, and we'd be in the car, we'd be travelling for four hours, and me and Jermaine would just start doing this. I, I know, know a song that'll get on, get on your nerves. Get, get on, on your nerves. nerves. <laughs> get on your nerves. Yeah. I know a song that'll get <laughs> on your nerves. Get, get on, on your nerves. nerves. Get, get on, on your nerves. nerves. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> Get it was on one of those things that came get on your nerves. It got funnier as time went on. Nerves. You know, you do it and then you get an eagle, stop it. No, stop it. No, no stop it. And then stop. And it gets funny again. Yeah. <laughs> he's, actually, he's actually done it to me in the car. And like, you know, it'd be the, like, the next day I'd be walking around. Huh? I know, so song get on your <laughs> I just wanted to sort of like, you know, float this. I, I, when I read that Larry King was getting married for the eighth time, 
it, it, it got me thinking, right? I think when you're buttering up for the eighth time, are you saying to yourself, no, I, I reckon this is it. You know, <laughs> this is I reckon one. this is actually the one. It was a mistake seven times in a row, but none of this time. Or is it the sort of thing where you just can't get out of it? After you've been married that many times, you're going out with someone, they'd be going, well, you know. What's wrong with me? You married everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'm impressed by really good. just because he's such a creepy guy, isn't he? <laughs> Larry King. <laughs> totally and creepy. to find eight women that will marry you when you're that creepy. And wear your pants is, that high. Is <laughs> that impressive? See, I don't even think he wears pants. That's how creepy I think he is. I don't think the suspenders are attached to anything. Because there's always one point when he interviews a woman, especially, doesn't matter who the woman is, where he says something horribly inappropriate and creepy, over-the-top creepy. Like, he'll have Madeleine Albright on, the, the former Secretary of State, just kind of the stately 60-something woman, be at, talking about peace in the Middle East, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he'll just blurt out, is one of your breasts bigger than the other? <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeff, you, uh, you married an Australian girl. Yes. Now, so, so how have, how have you visa. found the uh, transition? I had to come in on the spousal visa. We had to prove to an immigration officer that we were really married and had been for 13 years, and it, didn't, it wasn't that hard. We just um, showed him our slouch posture and the deadened look in our eyes. <laughs> I got picked up for being on the mobile phone in the car and, you know, I'm sitting at the lights and I'm on the phone and then I hear on the window and I look and the cop is going, hey, one, one minute, man, can, can you see him on the phone, you know? <laughs> Bang, and I wind the window down, I move it across here and I go, oh, mate, how quick are you bastards? I said, I've been ringing you because the bloke in front of me is pissed, swerving all over the road. I said, I want to get him off the road before he kills some bugger and you just turn up like that! <laughs> well, I'm gone! <laughs> And uh, he laughed. <laughs> well, what, what about the police with the beach balls at the cricket? You know, stabbing them. I mean, my yeah. son's five. Someone threw a beach ball to him. They tasered him. Yeah, it, it's... <laughs> 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 yeah, it's, it's not in the brochures, though, is it? Join the police force. They have a beach ball. <laughs> it's not in the brochures. I was driving a bus full of comics on, a, uh, on an outback tour. We go through Wagga. We get stopped by the RBT. I, I, I blow into it. The, the constable shows my breathalyzer to the sergeant behind him and goes, what do we do? And I hear the sergeant go, why? He's only as blind as everyone else. And then they just wave me off. <laughs> So walk is the place to go if you're ever in doubt. I remember once with you at the Prince Patrick Hotel blowing vodka into one of those breathalyzer machines. <laughs> it was your scientific experiment. <laughs> <laughs> 9.8. Hey! We used to have competitions. Yeah, yeah. See, I wanted to get a full hundred out of it. Because you get a free game. Yeah. <laughs> We had the family dogs and, yeah, like, yeah. you know, they, and the, they were just part of the house. I mean, they yeah, lived yeah. in the house. They, they were on your lap watching telly. Like, they slept in the beds, like, with heads on pillows, <laughs> right? And my parents went away one time uh, when we were, you know, when I was about 16. Yeah. And they were going away for the weekend. So what do you do when you're 16? Hey, party! party. Yeah. All right, party. <laughs> so we were staying at my nana's place on the Saturday night. So, uh, you know, on the sad day, we sort of, you know, fed the dogs and we locked them in and then went over to Nana's place. And, of course, you know, I've said, I'm going to, you know, Paul's place and going back to my place for the party. Of course, word's got around about the party. 200 people show up. The yeah. joint is being absolutely destroyed. And my, my <laughs> nana lived about three k's away. Meanwhile, about 9.30, there's a scratch on the door at my nana's place. The dog's at the party, shat itself because there's so many people around. <laughs> my nana opens the door going, what are you doing here? Wait a second. <laughs> Busted by my dog. <laughs> and, and the joint just got absolutely destroyed. They, they got my stepfather's drink cabinet. They just drank everything in the drink mm. cabinet. And I was like, I got home and I was just going, oh, no. My grandfather had given him a bottle of port from the year he was born. Oh, no. And I just went, oh, my God. Yeah. And it was there, still full. <laughs> and I went, oh, there is a God. After all, I picked it up, I looked in it, and someone had dropped a cigarette butt. Oh, <laughs> oh no. In the bottle of port. So yeah. the, dogs, the dogs actually walked up to your Nana. <laughs> See, if you ever had a cat, had a cat, the cat would have just got on the phone. Hey, Nana, there's shit up in here. <laughs> <laughs> you love to take the dog in the car all the time. With mm. me. One time I actually took it in the car, right? And I've, I've gone, done some shopping. Thought, I'll buy a bit of a treat for the dog. So I've gone out, bought the sausage roll, like, brought it back to the car, go, oh, a bit hot, bit of, and I'll <laughs> cool it down, give it to the dog, 
drive off, unbeknownst to me, the dog went the quiet spew. <laughs> In the foldy bits of the handbrake, right? I've looked at the dog, dog looks at me going, Mm. <laughs> oh my God, pack shit. I've opened the car door, put it outside. The dog's done another quiet spew on the sidewalk. Because mm. like, dogs aren't like humans when they spew yeah. like that. Yeah, they human spew. Go, oh, wait, oh, wait, I'm spewing. But the good thing about, <laughs> the good thing about dogs is they sit there and spew and then they go, that looks good, I'll eat that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, it's not their fault, dogs. Like, God just went, I'm going to invent an animal that's friendly yep. and is programmed to eat. Like, no. yeah, and you know straight away, like, you walk in the door and you go, hi, boy, and he goes... <laughs> <laughs> and you go, what have you done? <laughs> what have you done? You walk around, oh, my shoe! What you eat my shoe for? <laughs> and you say, oh, sorry, I couldn't help it, there was no food. <laughs> what about when you come home and uh, you just see them and they're just looking at you and you know they've been licking their private parts and they just jump up and start licking <laughs> you? <laughs> Hang on a minute. You know, here's a flannel, wash your face, do something. We, we actually took our dog to get mated at one point when I was a kid. Mm. And, uh, Mated? Yeah, well, we, to breed. Oh, we actually, right. We're oh, trying right. to breed. No, my dad used to do that and then he worked out they could do it themselves. We took uh, our dog to get mated with a male dog yeah. and I'm you know, standing by the window, I'm not really sure whether to look out or not, yeah. but then again I figure we'll bugger it off, paid. <laughs> And I noticed that all the way through, like, the other dog is keeping its eyes shut. Oh, no. And I'm thinking, do dogs, when they're doing it, think about other dogs? <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe he's not into Shetland sheep dogs. Maybe he's a chihuahua man. <laughs> Have you found any benefits in uh, your advancing years, Anthony? In, in approaching 40, you worry about getting old. And I'm, oh man, looking down the barrel of 50 now and silver grey and just rolling in it. <laughs> and old is just rocks. Kids on skateboards come towards me on the footpath stop and pick them up and walk for a bit. Oh, nice. In case they bump me. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a HT 1969 Belmont Ute. Skateboard? Yeah, it's not <laughs> shiny, neither. <laughs> so in the traffic in Hobart, which I know most of the rest of the country probably thinks, what traffic? <laughs> and I'm waiting there and I'm thinking, we're never going to get out in this. Wait a minute. I've got grey hair. I'm in a farmer's car. I'm dressed like a farmer. My wife's knitting. <laughs> I'm just going to drive slowly out into the traffic. <laughs> and I did, and everyone stopped. <laughs> just worried about where I might go. I was at a, I was at a beach uh, over in West Australia. We decided to go for a nude swim. I swear, I don't know why, on a day where there were stinging jellyfish in the water. <laughs> <laughs> swam out the back, and I said to Selena, come on, come out the back, it's really good. <laughs> and at that point, I swear, I was stung on the... Yes, by a singing jellyfish. It was a fairly easy target for the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I had this. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I had this lightning bolt welt across the end of. If I ever have kids, they'll automatically have that Harry Potter thing on them. <laughs> but... You know what really gets to me? Uh, the warning labels on anything. Whoever invented, because they. Those, have you ever noticed how stupid they're like? Food, you know, fruit sort of thing, dried fruit. Remove plastic before eating. Oh, was I that stupid? Packet of suppositories. To true, packet of suppositories. Remember to remove your finger. Because it was like three years, wouldn't I? I'd be going to the bus thinking, where was that finger I had? And then I'd go to try use the suppositories. You might go out. Yeah, with my finger. You'd be halfway what? through your wedding speech <laughs> and you're trying to turn the page. Right. Didn't I used to have another hand? Yeah, it's right. <laughs> I had a start like yeah, the suppository packet. I've lost my, my ring, I'm the leader. Yeah, right. <laughs> Gentlemen, it's fun to talk like gangsters. I mean, American gangsters is one thing, gentlemen, but let me have a word in your shell light. <laughs> Some tow rag has done me over. <laughs> Some tow rag has had it on his arches with my wife's Tom Foolery. <laughs> I want you to get in my motor, go down to the boozer and find the tow rag who's done me up like a kipper and I want his knuckles in a bag. <laughs> Do I, I make him. myself crystal? I've seen him. I went up to him and I said, right, look, 
I don't mind you. I don't mind you, you, uh, you tea caddies, but don't get on the old Joanna, right? Don't big up the chest. Don't tug the toggle, mate. Don't give it all that. Because I tell you, you know, I don't mind you sort, but don't fuck me about, you know? <laughs> don't fuck me about. Because you start tugging the toggle, you big up the chest, I want to take you down, you fucking toilet. <laughs> Now, you've been a bit previous there, my son. Shut <laughs> it. Shut <laughs> You haven't got the bottle. Look, his problem is, he's right fucking radio, that bloke. He's, he's, he's totally fucking radio rental. Right off the air, you know? <laughs> you are well out of order, my son. Well out of order. Oh, it's, it's like so being yeah. in a film, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's for another, isn't it? Time to talk about gangsters. Now... Some ideas look good on paper, and I refer to the famous quote from the astronaut John Glenn, who said, it's a fine idea to be an astronaut until you're sitting on a 20-storey rocket built by the people who put in the lowest tender. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... But, uh, gents, have you got any thoughts on things that look good on paper but didn't quite come off? I was just going to say Tiger Woods' marriage. <laughs> Imagine screwing up so badly in a relationship that you have to hold a press conference to apologize. <laughs> I know I'm in trouble when I find myself at the florist buying flowers for my wife. Imagine screwing up so badly that you find yourself out buying a podium and a microphone. <laughs> Family party tricks. Yes? My brother used to do a thing where he, if he was at a barbecue, he would grab a knife and then grab someone's wrist, flip the knife over, expose their wrist and go, cut your wrist and use the back of the knife and go, ha, ha, that was a good trick. Anyway. <laughs> I think we can see where this is going. Right? Yeah. He went flip, flip, grabbed this girl's wrist and went, and cut her wrist. Oh and she went, what, what did you do that for? <laughs> and he went, it, it's a joke. <laughs> It's the same as when I was at school. I was, uh, there was, it was a game around our school where you would walk up to someone, you'd measure it out, and then, and then you'd yeah. go, punch you in the face like that. Anyway, I'm going, oh, this is really good. So I go home to see Mum, and, uh, <laughs> and I walk up and say, hey, Mum, punch you in the face. And I hadn't measured it out, and I just went, smack, and cracked her right in the head. <laughs> what did you do that for? And I went, it's a trick. 